I'll tell you briefly that I, uh, in the months leading up to start renewing Alder Track again, I was taking a couple of hours each night and learning R, the programming language. And then I switched to spending like five hours a night working on the Chicago politics. And both are, uh, as you might expect, really difficult to understand, but there's a, there's a lot of power in both. And um, they're both sort of sometimes coherent and sometimes not so coherent. So I'll tell you that. I'll also tell you that AlderTrack is this, we refer to it as a quadrennial hobby vertical news service because we ring it up every four years and then we put it to sleep and it's not our day job, so it's a hobby and it focuses just on politics. And we like to think it's political news, particularly news that's not covered so well by um, major media. Um, back in 06, it was just a blog uh, that I ran by myself. And um, what I learned was that it's really hard to generate uh, any money uh, at all. <laughs> and when it's hard to generate money with a blog, it's hard to sustain it even as a hobby. So then back in September of 2010, my partner, my new partner then, Mike Fouché, and I connected with the Chicago News Cooperative. Does anybody remember the Chicago News Cooperative? I know some people do. Uh, so this was a really great uh, endeavor, small journalism, uh, which was affiliated with the New York Times. So on a certain day of the week, if you bought the New York Times, you'd see a whole Chicago section in the back, which uh, Mick Dunkey, uh, Dan Michalopoulos, Jim Kirk, really great Chicago journalism people doing really great news. And and folded it up uh, as planned after the elections. And the lesson we learned there was not long after we folded up Alder Track as a part of um, Chicago News Cooperative. It was technically not called Alder Track, but was called Early and Often, which is a, now owned by the Sun-Times, which bought Chicago News Cooperative. Um, long story short is we learned that even the traditional news organizations, at least this is our opinion, are having a rough go at getting local political news right. And we're not sure, we have some theories as to why that is, and I'll probably talk about it a little bit. Um, okay, jump to August 2014, Mike and I again, partner with another rough uh, sort of editor writer, Ramsey Cannon, some of you might know, it's written for Chicagoist, a couple of other people, and all along the way, it's sort of the same problem. We, we feel like local media outlets are not doing a great job covering local politics, beyond the mayor's race, I mean, they do that pretty well. Um, we also feel like government data about candidates leading up to important elections <laughs> is living in these uh, places with bad UI and sort of hard to get at, and it's all over the place. So we sort of decided, like, we're going to do po local politics coverage really well, and we're going to provide it in a simple little format. It's, like, digestible, and so we launched it up again. And we don't want to be called journalists because we, we feel very strongly that we're working with news, but we're not journalists. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. Okay, let's go. Right? No. Okay. Uh, just a quick view of tools that we like. Um, we've managed to launch Oliver Track with a really small amount of money. And that's and due in large part to all of the wonderful web services that we're using. So, you know, we use WordPress. Uh, of course, we do a lot of our, all of our daily emails with uh, MailChimp. We do some webinars uh, and we use Twitter. And, and so if you're not familiar with any of these, you know, you can talk to me after. By the way, it all rolls up into Slack. Uh, how many people are familiar with Slack? This is really worth checking out um, if you haven't because we love it. And then we use this uh, Open Workspace Collaborative Coalition on Superior, which is quite nice when we need to get to, together for face-to-face -to -face meetings. Tools we don't love but use anyway, you can see them all in the middle there. I don't have to say, I sort of, you know, I might be the only person who's really good at Visio, and I can't, like, stop using it, even though I don't, I, I don't want it in my life anymore. <laughs> um, I put the Board of Elections website on there because, you know, it's pretty useful. I mean, all the data is there, and it's updated really frequently, it's just that, you know, I don't think the people who designed that were really thinking about how to get data about candidates and elections to people quickly and easily, because it doesn't, it's not so quick, and it's not so easy. 
And then tools we avoid, um, we actually started a print version of Alder Track that I'll talk about in a minute. Really didn't work out uh, very well at all. Um, we don't think Facebook is uh, useful at all, particularly for reaching small sort of niche audiences. And we don't use the phone and we don't drive cars and we don't, we do drink coffee, but we don't do these things all at once. <laughs> um, here's a quick glance at our sales. So if you don't know, AutoTrack is a free daily email um, with some news aggregation. And we're also doing uh, our own uh, polls now with the election coming up and we're doing video interviews with candidates. So we're doing a lot that's free. But then we also have this racing form, which is about a 78 page PDF updated daily. You get it for 10 bucks. Um, and if you, you know, you could have bought it uh, last October, you could buy it tomorrow. It's still just 10 bucks. And we add uh, contribution data, endorsement data. We just add a lot of information and pull it all together so you can consume it and use it as a reference. I've seen a lot of people um, print it out and you know, use highlighters. So. The sales, as you might expect, like spiked right when we uh, launched. And that next big spike is when uh, candidates filed their nomination papers. If, you, if you've never seen that, it's a really great Chicago political ritual where people line up um, starting at like at six in the morning because they want the first position on the ballot. And then with an hour to go at the end of the candidate nomination filing window, people line up again because they want the last position on the ballot, right? There's some data that suggests there's a little bump there if you're first or last. Um, okay, and then this is what I want to talk about, and then we'll just jump right into questions. So these are like the new lessons we're learning this, uh, this third go-around. Um, the first thing is the audience for Chicago politics isn't as big as you might think. And we feel like we've, we've learned this in part because of our early on experience in 2007, and now with our uh, Twitter account and our emails, like we really don't think that the audience people who really care about Chicago politics is much bigger than 6,000 people. Uh, might seem like a lot, but I had always assumed it was, that everybody was interested in Chicago politics. So, um, you know, I guess the lesson there is know your audience before you try to sell to them. Um, number two, politics junkies are more interested in raw data and info and less interested in reporting and analysis. And, I, you know, I, we just, we've talked to these folks and they're really smart. Like they don't learn very much from the long articles in the newspaper about what's new. Like if anything, they're making that new. So what we find they are interested in is up to the minute information and data that they can take and apply, you know, to their own chess moves. Like I like to think of it like they know all the great chess openings and all the great chess moves. They just want to be sure they know where the pieces are, and and that's they'll make their moves based on that. Um, number three, it takes a lot of effort and inside knowledge to produce quality product for junkies. I, that's just, uh, it's like a fact of life. I, you have to talk to these folks and you have to let, allow them a platform to tell you, either in broadcast form or directly on the DM, uh, like what they know to be true or what they feel is true and what they're willing to share and what they're not. It's really fun. Uh, number four, Traditional advertising doesn't do much to increase penetration among junkies. When I say junkies, I just mean any small niche audience as far as I'm concerned. Um, we tried some, uh, we experimented with some Twitter advertising, some Facebook advertising, and some other, our ads on other news media outlet blogs. And we just didn't see it driving penetration or, or purchases of our product in, in anywhere near the fashion where um, other people mentioning us on Twitter However, like we did see some correlations. The more people were referencing us on social media, the more people were choosing to buy the uh, form. That, that wasn't true in traditional advertising. I uh, talked about Facebook. Number six, no matter how simple the purchase process, there will always be problems, and you should solve them quickly because people get upset when their low-resolution you know, browser doesn't allow them to uh, hit the purchase button or hit, hit it twice and they buy it twice, you know. Uh, we, we thought we had a handle on that. We prepared for it really well, but we still had some fun. Uh, as a medium for small runs, print is dead. I think we, uh, you know, we're a small example of this, but it's really expensive to print uh, Alder Track. We did a, a racing form and print form and distributed them to like uh, 
35 different neighborhood dive bars. You can still go online and find those bars. And you can probably still find the print version of all the there because nobody was buying them. Um, and so this was just the theory that we had that people would really long for the printed uh, copy. Now, I will say a lot of our consumers tell us that, oh, I love to print it, print it out and take it with me on the car. So I think maybe the news there is give them something they can print, but don't expect them to go to like Quindy's and buy, you know, or uh, the L&L in &L Belmont and Clark, which is a great place. Um, nothing is harder than keeping it, oh, sorry, best news comes from great engaged readers. Talked about that. Nothing is harder than keeping it simple. You know, we, we struggle with this even today. Uh, we we, we want to get the, our consumers to the data as quickly as possible because we know they lead hectic lives and they're consuming lots of other bits of information from lots of other sources. They don't expect to like spend more than a few minutes uh, diving into Overtrack and, and jumping back out. Um, I talked about exposure on other media being overrated. Um, video, it doesn't get many eyeballs, but it makes you seem very professional. And that, that only goes for Alder Track, but I think some of the candidates themselves, you know, once they appear even on like a three minute video interview, um, you, you start to put up, you know, you start to put some, you start to understand who that candidate is as a person, as opposed to just reading about their name. And this is particularly true for candidates from the South side and the West side who are not are getting like no coverage whatsoever. They're having a hard time even getting their names out, let alone somebody who's willing to give them a few minutes in a professional studio with some professional uh, quality video. Um, this disappear? Okay, gosh. Um, then the next point is that professional do-it-yourself video, if you don't already know this, is here and it's really affordable and you should do it whenever you can because all of our videos are running on two iPhones with tripods and a lavalier mic. Um, it's like 1080p and we've had um, nothing but great success. The people we interview, when they see the product, they always say, oh, I can't believe that. I was sitting there like looking at you know, an iPhone that really looked like professional quality stuff. Um, Alder Track and DNA info aside, Neighborhood political news is near zero, as far as we can tell. And even DNA isn't covering large swaths of the, the neighborhoods, um, which is really too bad because the more we learn about some of the ward races on the south side and on the west side, the ones that aren't being covered, they're way more interesting than like 43rd Ward, for example. I mean, I've, I've read more articles uh, in the dailies and about the 43rd Ward, uh, like 10 times more articles than I've read about like most of the others combined, and I think that's a shame. Um, more open government data leads to more, not less, information arbitrage opportunities. And so we think about this a lot, information arbitrage. It's like if you're, you know, arbitrage is like the simultaneous purchase and sale of an asset at a profit because there's a difference in the price. And we think that's what politics is all about, particularly in this city. It's like if you know something that other people don't know, and you think that you stand a lot to gain by that, um, that gives you a lot of influence. And especially when releasing that to others empowers them to make decisions that help you achieve your objectives. There's, there's a truth in there somewhere. Um, and then the last point is talk to almost everyone, which is we, we try to spend as much time as we can uh, talking to people, meeting with people, um, convincing people that it's in their best interest to help the interested readers know what's going on in Chicago politics. And I think our challenge now is how do you sustain that when the election's over? Because as, as, as low as our voter turnout is in municipal elections, and it's pretty low, um, I think the interest level goes down even lower when it's like, the year after the municipal election, the second year after the municipal election, and then we pick it back up. Like, oh, there's a municipal election coming up, you know, in, a, in one more year. So what we're really trying to do now is think of some new news products and think of some new open data products that can help uh, spread political information uh, to neighborhoods and community organizations and special interests um, because we we find that like 
to be the best part of living in Chicago is we have this really rich Chicago uh, political tradition, and we don't think that it's something we should like, not be reporting on. So I think that's it. Oh, I wanted to mention we're going to have a uh, first ever Alder Track party somewhere on election night, <laughs> and we want you all to come. We also want you to help us think about how we take the, you know, I talked about the sort of bad UI that the Chicago Board of Elections has to display the election returns. Well, we'd like to think about how we've got all these screens, these digital TV screens in the, in the, in the bar that we're having the party at. And we'd like to think about how do we build like a middleware that just says, all right, I'm going to take it from this UI and display it on this UI. Because there'll be a lot of, we think we're going to attract a lot of like campaign managers and there are going to be people who want to celebrate, people who want to commiserate, and we're hoping to, to bring them all together. So that's my wrap. Uh, I'd love to answer any questions or if you got any reactions, any burning issues. I have a question. So you mentioned that the 43rd Ward is like not as interesting, but has a lot of coverage. I mean, do you have like, so tell us about the wards that do, that are the most interesting to you, that you yeah. like have gotten a lot of. That have gotten a lot of coverage. Yeah, yeah. So the right general, which ones are the most interesting? So the one that, um, <laughs> was a uh, <laughs> don't, don't talk about that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, um, all right, so, I mean, there's there's an interesting race coming out of the Ninth Ward, and here's why. I've known the Ninth Ward inside um, Pullman, uh, really far south side. There's a community called Chesterfield. Uh, there's Altgeld Gardens in the Ninth Ward, it's, uh, public housing development. And so you have this incumbent, Anthony Beal, who's been reelected a couple of times, ran for Congress, uh, didn't win that. And all of these interesting races, by the way, usually involve an incumbent who seems like they might not you know, get to 50%. We'll see. But in this case, you have somebody from the northern portion of the ward, which is um, uh, like the Chesterfield community I spoke of, a guy named Michael Lafar. And then you have uh, Harold Nooney Ward from the Elkdale Gardens House of Public Housing, who's an admittedly former gang member who is doing a really good job with video talking about like why people should not reelect the incumbent and why they should elect him. And it's just, you know, there's the, that, that neighborhood down there is um, really the reverse of Lincoln Park. It's like falling on really hard economic times. Jobs are very scarce. And they have some, they have some issues that local aldermen, as you referred to earlier, like, can really make an impact on a ward in a way that like presidential or congressional uh, elections can and then the, some of the another interesting one on the 37th ward, which is the far west side, you have an incumbent who's allied closely with the mayor, and you have uh, a challenger who's allied closely with the CTU. And so the reason I think we think that one's interesting, and there are a number of other wards like this, is because like a little bit of a proxy fight, right? It's really the mayor isn't running for re-election. Nobody's electing the CTU. They're sort of at odds with each other, and it's playing out at, at various aldermanic levels with some new faces and some, you know, faces that have been around for a long time. And then a lot of money flowing around too. So right about now, two or three weeks before an election is when you start to see big money drops from various special interests who philosophically have a very uh, clear view of how they want the city you know, to function or the policies that they believe in. And so those are just two examples. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I don't know I, if I can answer that, but I know that there is a group of women candidates for aldermen called Women Against the Machine. So I think if you hashtag and search that, you'll actually find like these 12 uh, women, uh, all non incumbents, so they're all challengers. And they're talking a lot about women's issues as a, at, a, at a local level. And that's uh, something new. We haven't seen that before. Also new this year is, I should let you know, I've totally missed out on the objections process. If any of you don't know, Chicago has this tradition where you say you're running for all of them, right? File all this paperwork. And then somebody, anybody off the street can come in and say, I object to this person running for all of them. <laughs> And then you, all you have to do is say, like, he didn't do anything right. And then you go in front of a hearing officer, and the candidate has to come down and say, I did do it right. And, you know, here, I feel here's my receipt. And 
and attorneys get involved where they spend a lot of money and it's really um, like belligerent sometimes. And anyway, I thought I'd mention that. <laughs> that was pretty fun. Yeah. Oh yeah, thanks. Why are those interesting? Like yeah. I, I already get ten of them a week from one candidate. Yeah. That no. My picture is one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious how people respond to seeing the mailers that they're not actually receiving themselves. Well, that, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing we think about our readers sharing the fact that I got this mail or here's a scanned image of it is, before you wouldn't know that. Like, you would know it, the resident of the home. But you wouldn't be able to share it citywide with a group of shared interest, you know, political watchers. Um, it's also interesting because, you know, if you're an incumbent and you've got 400000 in your account and your challengers have, like, 10000 each in their accounts – you typically don't see an incumbent spend any money on mailers. Maybe a little bit one, two, but the theory is the, as the frequency of those mailers occurs and as those mailers may get, go negative on a person, which we call hit lit, if you get some hit lit, then it might be a sign that you know somebody's feeling uncomfortable with the, the competition, meaning they think it's close, like I gotta, I gotta knock this person down with mailing up. And I've asked a political consultant, don't you worry that voters are going to be like, I am so fed up with getting another mailer from this person. No, I'm not going to vote for it. And they're like, no, the data doesn't support that theory at all. It's like the more mail you get in front of somebody, and the better, the more likely you are to vote for it. Do any candidates have digital mailers that they don't actually mail out uh, well, online or We have seen, I know, Michelle Smith in the 43rd Ward, the challenger of the 46th Ward incumbent, James Kaeperman, a woman by the name of Amy Crawford is doing Facebook ads. I know that uh, political consultants are increasingly saying for um, the price point for putting ads, I guess it's when you take a post and you like boost it somehow and pay for click, you know, all of that, because uh, that's just the, the trend that they're seeing. So, yes, people are doing Facebook ads mostly. Yeah, of course. So, I'll okay. be really well, so just to the booths that Frank are making are about trying to sell to a very target elite audience for whom the news is something that they need in order to do their business today. Yeah. Um, I know it's, it's not your job to figure it out, not exactly what you're trying to do right now, but where, what is, what is, where does the public interest news come um, in? Like, how do you think about the fact that like, your body is not the public? It's right. Like, really small group of folks yeah. who aren't paying, who maybe have a really kind of orthogonal set of interests to what you know about, you know, what you know sort of think that the public might know. Is there, what, is there a way that you see be squared, or is it just that we need to be able to see more of this where yeah. what the news is just going to become more and more about, uh, about Niche. the news? Yeah. We used to think more about that, and I, and I don't know that we think about it very much. Now we seem firmly settled in this world where if all we ever get are like political news type people, or political beasts, you know, reading our news, then that means we don't have to explain things that we know they already know. It makes our jobs easier, and it helps us get to other information. It's, it's really hard to um, do news and explain it. I mean, you see it, and when I read a news article, I'm always like, yeah, yeah, like I know, I know. <laughs> and, I don't, and I don't know who's doing it really anymore, aside from the newspapers. We're, we're becoming much more fragmented. I don't know if we're ever getting back to that general interest news reader. Are there any here tonight? I don't know. <laughs> All right, other questions? Yeah. Um, I got a robocall. Do you track those? Because I would vote against anybody in that robocall. Yeah, I got one. Um, I use phone tag, which is a voicemail transcription. So I don't answer my phone. It goes to voicemail. They transcribe it and email it to me. And it was like, did you know that second order Alderman Challenger 
Alex Patterson used a fake policeman in an ad. <laughs> and so we posted that, you know, as soon as we got it. That's like an example of something we're really interested in. in getting. Yeah, if you don't know, there, there was a candidate, I don't know if it's a big sin, but one of her opponents is trying to make it to be like this felony crime. It is, it is apparently a felony to impersonate a police officer. And so she's in an ad, one of her mailers, like she's talking to, you know, what appears to be a policeman, but if you look really close, he's got a different color, navy blue hat on, and it's not a police issue thing. And so yeah, we track those. Global calls are huge, by the way. I think for as little as less than four cents a call. Imagine, imagine how many people you know you can reach. What app was that? <coughs> what was the name of the app? Um, the phone tag, mine. Oh, yeah. yeah, phone tag. That's a good one. Yeah. Are you seeing any activity on the referenda that are going to be on the city ballot on the 24th? Small donor referenda. Oh, the small donor referenda? No, I, I thought you were referring to the um, elected representative school board, which is if you if you live in one of 37 different wards, that's going to be on that. It's totally an advisory question because we don't we're not California, you know, that voters decide things directly, but um, I don't know about that one, the small donor one. Is that one? That was the one that uh, the mayor decided to use the not walk Oh, right, right. So the, the, you can only have three advisory referenda on a municipal ballot, and all the people in the city who, don't, who did not want the voters to be asked whether they want an elected representative school board came up with these three, like, sort of not monumental questions that uh, are actually going to appear citywide, but then the proponents of the elected school board said, well, fine, we can go ward to ward. So they had to get their organizations to go to the voters each ward and submit it ward by ward, which is the way around the city. But I would like to make a pitch for the small donor. Okay, so you're saying there's one that's good. Okay, I will. I, I, will, I will research that. Because, yeah. I was just wondering, to get back to the question on Public information for the public. Yeah. Are you, because I haven't seen this yet, do you feel like you are putting information out there that the average voter would benefit from knowing and you're not getting into this now? Or is this more like information about the horse race that's just like sort of yeah. background for the public? Well, I think, I think that um, the average voter. Especially if they were to buy a ten dollar form, because the form itself lets you go to your ward and lets you see pictures of who's running, the names of who's running, the Facebook page of who's running, the Twitter uh, account, the LinkedIn profile, their campaign contribution funds. So it's the best resource you can have, even as a voter generally not informed in the details of politics. I think where you maybe lose out as a general interest news consumer is when you have to like if you're following our Twitter feed just to get information about like a single candidate, you're gonna be reading a lot of stuff and you're like, what and you don't even know what they're talking about. And then you might get to something you know if you're interested in. So there's something in there for the generalist. It's just it's more of a specialist. So you don't really feel it's a way of, like a public service thing in terms of unearthing information that could be more like yeah, I think it's more like information. And I think we do, I would argue that we do a much better job providing people with uh, basic information about who's running than even the Board of Elections. I, I think that's fair. So you thought about things, I mean, a lot of it would just be like, why are you need somebody to the and to yeah. lay it out. Yeah, in brief little news cycles. All right, a couple more questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Um, so I was involved in a, the last mayoral election, and uh, I have my own opinions about what elections are. And then <laughs> their PO, PR shows and facts do not matter within the elections themselves whatsoever. However, the facts that you're generally reporting on are the ones that, are, uh, that matter. And that's one of the big disconnects between the general public and what's going on, because yeah. There is no connection. These these politicians are involved in a drag down, knockout fight, and they're doing anything they can possibly think of to win. Um, I guess that editorializing aside, 
have you found um, that you guys are one of the only folks out there that are doing this, and that you've been able to connect some of the few services that are out there that are trying to translate all that into some narrative? Yeah, I think we are locally. There are others. Somebody mentioned Daily Whale, which Daily Whale, uh, to my knowledge, is focusing more on like a little bit of the minutia of what's going on in various different commissions and zoning board appeals, you know, whereas we're staying focused on the elections for now. Um, it is interesting, though, to see uh, the extent to which new, mostly online, <coughs> national political news organizations are starting to, and this is also true of special interest groups like Allen, for example, are starting to understand the, the influence and power of state and local and county officials on policy na nationwide. Now, again, it's, you have to be willing to live in a fragmented world, world. Um, but like we read uh, the Alder Tracks version in San Francisco and New York and Washington, D.C., because we're just as, in not just as interested. After show Chicago political news and before national news, we're interested in what's going on in other big cities. And I would argue that for people who really care about big city issues, you have more to learn by looking at what's going on in Philadelphia than you are going to learn from like MSNBC or CNN or Politico. All the action, I think, real policy action that happens at the state. So does that answer your question? All right, how about one more right here? So you said that uh, more open data creates more opportunities for data. Yeah. Um, can you say a little bit more about that? <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think the, the causes are for who's doing data arbitrage and do you see it as a good thing? Yeah, okay, that's a really good question. Maybe one good one to end on. Um, so I, you know, let me, I'll use uh, Stephen Vance over there, my good friend who's texting. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I, I was explaining to somebody, um, there was somebody who was asking me, like, there's got to be a way for me to, like, talk about how crummy of a job my opponent is doing, right? This is a candidate, right? And they're like, I know they're not, that he's not contributing in the way that he should as an elected, you know, alder. And the, the person um, became aware of the fact that now with, like, Chicago Cityscape, and this is also true of any other open gov app, that you can find, you can get at data quickly and compare it to the services that are occurring in other wards and make a claim. Now, as it turns out, this person that I was dealing with was going up against an incumbent who was already using his service, the Chicago system, right? It was like ready with the data. So they were having like a, like, okay, if you think not, if you, if you're going to say that I'm doing a comparatively poor job of dealing with abandoned vehicles, you haven't seen my uh, abandoned property abatement uh, rate. <laughs> then I was like, I, like, I haven't seen that outside of like one or two wards. And I think that it's just a matter of time before there's people start turning to data to both defend themselves and to spring new uh, attack information. Or something. Like, the data is clear. He's clearly not doing a good job, you know, and let's move on. I think you're going to see that kind of thing. All right, well, it's a pleasure, and I'll stick around after, so thanks a lot.